There he is. I see you. I'm up in He's just waiting for his internet mice to make the magic happen. I'm there. Hey! Oh, look. Was, you've got your cap on because you've got uh, hair. I was going to I was gonna show everyone, yeah. Like, I've, I've started to like, do a man bum suit. It's getting that long now. <laughs> hey, look, I brushed my hair for you because when I looked at this afternoon when we did our test, I looked like I've been dragged through a hedge. <laughs> do you know what? I knew, I knew, I knew I should have got my hair cut before the lockdown. I was I was contemplating it and I was oh, I should have done it. I left it. I left it. I'm probably it's gonna all, have to get. I'm gonna have to buy a pair of clippers gonna... now and do it myself. Yeah, get it all off. Oh, I think <laughs> you should just let it go. I mean, oh, no. I've, I've got a hair like my little boys, and his just grows up and not down. So mine won't get any longer, but it's just will <laughs> grow this way and this way and this way, and I'll look a bit crazy by the end of it. It looks perfect though. It's good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like I've stepped out of the salon. <laughs> um, so we're going to go, we're going to start at 7 o'clock, John. Yeah. Um, what have you been up to today? Um, I did, uh, I got up this morning, I did a turbo this morning um, for two hours, and then I went and done some shopping and bought some essentials, uh, and, then, and then come home and spent the rest of the day just looking out my window at the sun, wishing I was outside a little bit more. Oh, no. <laughs> Do you have any Easter traditions? So I'm, from, I'm from the North East, from South Shields, probably guessed by the dodgy accent, but... Like, I was really shocked when I came as far south as Yorkshire, which isn't really very far south, but we always had a tradition. We'd get new clothes and mm -hmm. we'd always go to the fair. And like I, when I came here, nobody had that kind of tradition. Did yeah. you have an Easter tradition when you were a kid? Uh, uh, do you know what? I, we didn't when I was a little no? kid. No. no. I, I, Missed I, that I, on the fair. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I don't think we did. Like, I can. I think my mum might use. She might. She may have made like bowl bacon and like really some <laughs> Irish traditional food. But that's all I can really remember from like Easter. Boiled and, bacon, there's a and, and lots of Easter eggs. I used to eat lots of Easter eggs, hence why I was so overweight as a child. <laughs> uh, where's your home park run? Um, well, it would be it would be not Bushy Park, it would be uh, which one would it be? Wandsworth? Yeah, it would be one two in back. Okay. Beck. I've not done either of them. They, are they nice yeah, to do you know what I've not done? The, I've only ever really done the prison ones. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so I've done I've done Felton quite a lot of times now. I've been in there and done it for the kids in there quite a few times. Oh, amazing! Very, yeah, it's well, been very look, good. We've, we've got loads of people joining, so I think we should start. I'll give yeah. you a bit of an introduction, and then we'll we'll crack on with it, shall we? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm Helen Williams. I'm uh, part one at A six zero one four. I'm the event director of Harrogate Junior Park Run here in the UK. And alongside Bathos Alexander, I'm the co-presenter of the free Weekly Times podcast. Before we start, I'd just like to recommend that after this conversation, people check out the many social part, part one social media channels in the UK and across the world, as well as subscribing to the various part one podcasts out there. You'll find me on the free Weekly Times podcast, but there's also with me now and part one adventurers to name a couple of others. So, everyone, for today's question and answers, I'm joined by John McAvoy. John. John got off to a bad start in life when, before finishing his teenage years, he found himself in prison, serving a life sentence for armed robbery. Fortunately, he used that time to turn his life around, dedicating himself as an athlete and, on leaving prison, becoming a powerful advocate for rehabilitation and personal development. He has also collaborated with Chrissy Wellington and the rest of Park Run's health and wellbeing team in supporting the launch and rollout of Park Run events across the custodial estates of the United Kingdom, Ireland and Australia. Whilst we touch on John's backstory today, we'll be focusing mostly on his coping mechanisms for turning negatives into positives and surviving periods of time where our freedom is restricted. So please do add your questions to the comments. Um, we've got a team and they'll we'll put them to John at the end after we've had a bit of a chat. So John, how have you found today? Um, but is in today today. Yeah. Oh, the whole situation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like everyone else. It's, it's, you, you're obviously frustrated a little bit because you've had your um, you've had your sort of freedoms restricted. Uh, but. You have to remember, like tonight, I put the news on, and, and a lot of people have died today, and 
you can't lose sight of that and you can't lose perspective. Like me sitting indoors, it's going to have an impact on potentially saving other people's lives. Like everyone listens to this now. Um, and that's what we have to keep remembering. So we we are, it is frustrating, yes, but for the greater good of society and for humanity, we're, we're actually saving people's lives and that's what the most important thing is. Um, but so today, for instance, I got up this morning and I had my breakfast. Um, I've tried to keep a routine. So I've, I've tried to be getting up at the same time um, I went, I trained for a couple of hours on my turbo train on Zwift. Um, then I had some lunch, then I'd come off, then I was on calls all day working. Um, and then I'm talking to you now. So you've kind of tried to keep that routine. Before we go forward, let's go back because we did touch on that a little bit. So if you could give us a bit of a brief story, you know, about your, your story in brief, just so people who might not know or have heard of you can, can find yep. out. So, um, when, when I was a little boy, um, my real dad died before I was born. And um, so I grew up, I had no parental father figure. Then when I was eight years old, um, uh, a male come into um, my, my life, which, my, which was my mum's ex-husband. He'd just been released from serving a massive prison sentence for armed robbery and he kind of bought me up. Um, I was a really ambitious little boy. I went to retrieve something my life when I grew up. And, um, and he didn't have a son, I didn't have a dad. And I wanted to be successful and what I thought at that age was success was having lots of money and things and, and he had lots of money and he had nice things and I kind of sort of got sucked into this whole world of, of organised crime and when I was um, 18 I went to prison for conspiracy to rob. Um, when I was in there I spent a whole year in segregation in an isolation unit for 24 hours a day. Um, I come out of prison when I was 21, I was even worse. I didn't want to change, didn't want to be rehabilitated, then I got caught again when I was 22 and I got two life sentences when I went back to prison again. Um, and it only took the death of my friend when I was 26 years old. That I went to turn my life around and do something else. And, and I was very fortunate. Well, I've been doing cell circuits all those years. I had woke up a billet in my body I didn't know I had. And I got on a RAM machine when I was 26 years old and the prison officer saw how good I was. Um, and he went away and he came back a couple of days later and he gave me all these pieces of paper and had all these World and British records on an indoor RAM machine. And he planted the seed in my head and, and I realised I could be good at something and I, I wanted to achieve something in my life. And I, I still had that craving. I wanted to be successful. I used to think having lots of money was success, but then when I realised that I could potentially do something else with my life and be a sportsman, um, I thought that's what I'm going to do and I'm going to, I'm going to channel my energy into that. And that led me to breaking eight British records and three world records on an indoor round machine. And then I got released in 2012 and then I started doing Ironman <laughs> when I got released. <laughs> So you've obviously realised when you're in prison that you had this ability and that obviously sport was something that really helped you inside and then obviously coming outside. So you've managed to get the power of sport and understand it. So just let's just go back to part run because we, a lot of our viewers are, will all be part runners, they'll all be missing their part run. So you've, you've noticed the power of sport in prisons. Just talk to me about that, including the part run events that you've... Obviously, you see you go back to Falcon quite a lot. What do you yeah. see in there from 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 what you already know from being inside and then outside? So, like, obviously, the power of sport um, is a tremendously powerful hook, and it and it and it brings people in. Um, when you're in particular environments like prison, uh, you're dealing with a lot of disenfranchised young people and a lot of men that are disenfranchised with the system. Um, and you normally tend to find the prison officers that work in the gym are the ones that break those barriers down a little bit and get a better amount of engagement from the young people. Um, so part run in particular, uh, I went to the very first one in Felton Young Offenders on the very first day, and there were six of us that took part for the kids. I honestly cannot tell you the profound impact it has on them kids' lives. And, and I had never really understood it either. And it was only um, a, a lady called Michelle and Keith that run, helped run the park run from the Felton side, um, where they were telling us that when they would let the visitors come in like once a month to run with the kids, the kids' behaviour in the prison improved so much because when we went in and run with them, so when the park run community went inside and run with the kids, yeah. it was really the only outside interaction a lot of these young people were having with okay. people that were in non-authority. And, and I, one of the most powerful things I'd witnessed was I was running and I go in there just to, I want to run with the kids. I'm, I'm not interested in running for PBs or anything like that. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. And I run alongside a prison officer and a, and a kid that was in there, an 18 year old young man. And the young man was encouraging the prison officer not to give up <laughs> and quit. And it was incredible. But I was, I was watching it and, I, and this relationship between this guy that worked in the kitchens, like he was, he was a prison officer, but he worked in the catering kitchen part. 
And this young man that was 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 once upon a time, these two were completely on different sides of, of, of the line. And now suddenly he's encouraging him not to quit and not to give up. And this isn't the prison officer doing it to the kid, it's the kid doing it to the prison officer. And then, and, I feel, and it was really emotional to watch that. And, and I was, because I had never seen that before. And that, it was yeah. incredible. And, and it really does have such a profound impact on those young people's lives. In that. And, and I know, like, sometimes you can get some negativity outside. People go, well, it's only running. What does it really do? But it breaks down a lot of barriers. And it shows those young people that people care about them. And they yeah. want them to be successful. And they encourage them. And then their behaviour improves in the prison. And, and, and I, it is, honestly, it's been one of the best um, incentives I think, to go into the prison system um, as a sport. OK, which is absolutely amazing. So if we if we go back to your experience in prison, so we can kind of link this to what we're... Not, we're not in prison, are we? We have a lot of freedom at the minute, but we, it feels a bit odd. We feel constrained, don't we? We, we? we are feeling, you know, that we can't go where we want to go, when we want to go, with however many people we want to go to. So... That very first time you went into prison, how how did that feel when you first lost that freedom? So obviously, you know, you're you're running on adrenaline, you're in a, a world that's normal to you, and then you go into prison for the first time, you have lost all of the things that you had before. What was what did that feel like? So like when 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 I first the very first time I went to prison when I was a young man, I remember they um they, they transferred me to an adult prison. I wasn't allowed I wasn't kept with young offenders and I remember I was in a segregation unit in um in Woodhill prison in Milk Kings. And when I was in this environment, um I remember like I kept thinking like so for instance when I was in there on day one, I kept thinking yesterday I was outside, then I was in there Tuesday, I thought, what was I doing last Tuesday? And eventually, as the weeks progressed, then last Tuesday I was in prison, the Tuesday before that I was in prison, I would say to most people, what it is at the beginning, what's very hard to accept is when your routine of life gets broken, it's very hard to accept because it's very frustrating. And I think acceptance of the situation is very, it, it helps you adapt and deal with where you are at the moment. Um, yeah. And that's what gets you through the days. Um, because I think when you fight something, and at, and at the beginning, as I said, like when I first went in there, I kept counting down that, and I was fighting it because I kept thinking, this time last week I was in that restaurant, that mm -hmm. this time the week before I was in that bar, and I was with that person, and then suddenly my life started getting drawn into prison further and further and further, and I realised I had to stop remembering that stuff, and I just had to remember where I was in the present, and keep myself very present. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. It stopped the anxiety from building up in me, like, when's this ever going to end? Um, and then... I then constructed, which I would say to every single person, it's like, like I said at the beginning of it, which is so important, is, is, um, is routine. And it's keeping a routine, right? Don't start staying in bed to 10 o'clock in the morning if you used to get up at 7, because you'll, fall, you'll start falling into really bad habits and then getting up and then watching the news all day and, and then everything's very doom and gloom. Like, I understand you need to stay informed, but just do it in bite-sized chunks throughout the day just to see what's happening, but don't become consumed by it and intoxicated with it. Yeah. And, 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 and also, like... I, I, and I've said this time and time again over the last few weeks, like every person's life basically on the planet right now is, is on pause. And I think this is a very good opportunity for lots of people to assess their life before their life was put on pause. And, and when your life gets played again and, and, the, and the play button gets pressed in five weeks' time or six weeks' time, it's like, was I really happy doing what I did before I come to, before my life was pulled? Yes. And what can I do now to change my life when... Um, when, when things get going again, because this isn't going to go on forever. Like, it might go on for another six weeks, it might go on for eight weeks, it might end in four weeks, but it is going to end. This isn't indefinite. Like, yes. It's not going to go on forever. And I think yeah. this time now could be an amazing time for growth and, 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 and bettering yourself, like I did whilst I was in that prison cell. So it's, it's kind of a... So you reflected. So when you went in there, it was, a, it was a moment of reflection. But, of course, the first time you went in there wasn't the last time you went in there. So no. your moment of reflection didn't really happen, I guess, until you found sport. Yes, um, like, the, the, the first time I went in there um, and I started doing the cell circuits, that was because... So I did get into a routine, because routine, I think, is very important. But the cell circuits, and I was in a, was a, I was in a 12 by 8 foot cell, um, someone said to me once, when you go to prison, you don't live, you just exist. And I needed to feel alive like I was a human being. So I started doing these circuits. And before I went to prison, I was overweight, I was unhealthy, I used to party all the time. Um, but when I was in that cell and I started doing these exercises and, and the weight come off me and I got fitter and stronger, I felt alive. I felt like I was a human being. And, and I didn't realise at the time the, the effects it was having on my mental health, like how much of a positive effect it was having on my health. Because bear in mind, 
I was literally locked up in a 12 by 8 foot cell for 24 hours a day. Like, that was me done. I, I, there was no, I had no luxuries. I had no distractions other than what I had in that room, which was a bed, a table, and I had access to books. Um, every, uh, a librarian used to come around once a week to give me books and, and exercising. So that was all I had access to. And, and I would say to anyone listening to this now, like, if I've done what I've done for my life in that situation, imagine what anyone can do with their lives now with all the disposal of the luxuries that we've got at home with iPads and information and being able to learn and better yourself. Um, you, you, you can really use this moment for growth. And so you, you did sell circuits. And when you say you did sell circuits in such a small space, what, what did you start with? What, what, did that look, what did that look like? So what I used to have to do, um, I used to have to get, I, you, you, have a, I used to, I, you have one chair in your cell, so I used to get my chair, put it to the back of my cell wall, and um, it, so basically you had these tiny little vents on the windows, so they didn't, they weren't like normal windows, it would just open up, they would open yeah. up like a few inches, so it would allow a bit of fresh air to come in. So I used to start off and I used to do squats, I used to do burpees, I will do step-ups onto the chair to get that bit of breeze on me, press-ups and sit-ups. And I would start off, and at the beginning, I was so unfit. I would do like 10, 10, 10 of each exercise and start again, then 10, 10, 10, 10. And then as my body started adapting, and I didn't really understand what fitness was, it just got easier. Um, I basically then built them up, and I would end up doing a 1,000 of each exercise. Um, and then, again, I, that would take me like an hour to 90 minutes. But that, that was part of my routine. And, again, it, it made it made me feel so alive when I was in that cell, and I didn't yeah. feel like I was just existing. I felt human. Um, so yes. like, I really understand the positive effects of, of physical activity on the brain and how it can affect your body in such, and, a, and put you in such a positive well-being, even though you can be in a very sort of negative environment. And so you've, you, you use that as a coping mechanism. So r routine is really important, and that's something that we can, we can go back to. Um, and the exercise is really important because you wanted to feel alive. And, but also I think um, reading and just knowing that the outside world was outside was obviously another coping mechanism so where, did you project to a time when you would come out like when you think about all the things you used when you were in there to cope was that or, or did you just treat what you were doing reading and exercise reading and exercise yeah like w w when when i come it. out when when i got released um and and this is going to be applicable to every single person right now in the world um obviously mine was a little bit more extreme because it was the length of time but the things we take for granted, we will now realise how much we took for granted before. That might be going, like, I love going to the cinema. I go to the cinema most of the time on my own. I love watching films. And, and that's, got, that's been taken away from me now. And I will appreciate that so much more. Yeah. But it's appreciating the little things in life. And the things that you felt were important actually weren't that really important. And the things you didn't feel, like being able to get in your car and go down to the coast for, for, for a weekend away or go to the park and be with your friends and loved ones and actually be within two metres of each other um, and, and share that space. Being able to do park run, something that we get up and we, we take it for granted, Sarah, on a Saturday, you just put it as part of your life. And when that's yeah. withdrawn, you just take these little things for granted. And I don't think, um, I don't think many people will take these things for granted when this, these restrictions get lifted. No, which is, you know, we really need to feel like we've got something to look forward to once they get, they get lifted, don't we? Um, you must have learned, obviously you've learned a, a massive amount when you were inside and then applied it to, to bettering your life as you've come out. But what does it feel like with this weird constriction of freedom now? Are you using that same thing? I mean, it, it sounds very similar, like you are, you're making sure that you're, you have some form of routine. Does it feel a little bit like you slipped back into the way your mindset was when you were inside, even though yeah. obviously you can still you can still go out and we've got yeah. access no, to you know sky. No, yeah, I, I to, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, um, yeah, I do, I do, I do feel like um, it's kind of like in 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 a, in a sort of uh, dumbed down version. Like, I can, I've just my brain knows how to cope with this situation, so I can just go bang and, and revert back to kind of semi what I was doing years ago. But my biggest frustration in this whole situation has been um sort of, I've been in daily contact with a lot of people who work for a lot of charities and organisations across the country. And again, I, I, I was sitting here and I was getting really frustrated that I was hearing about all this hardship and, how, and some people are struggling and suffering so much with like losing their jobs and obviously family members dying, 
food banks, um, people trying to provide food for those and children that aren't going to school and that they might be at home in an, in a, an abusive household. Um, and I was getting really frustrated. And that's the thing I've really struggled with this time. Um, then, then what I have to cope with now, and, and, and I've had to think outside the box and think, how can I use my resources um, and access to things I can, can control to sort of help sort of people and, and try to give back um, from the situation that I'm in at the moment? And that's been quite challenging, I, I would say. The most challenging thing of this for me has been the fact that I felt quite hopeless and helpless to help other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you feel like, because of, because of where you came from in terms of how you grew up that you can you can see that a bit more like I, I'm, I'm from a council estate in South Shields and I, I think you know I, 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 I've often thought if this was my life if this had happened when I was eight well my life would have looked completely different you know I we had free school meals and we're seeing all of that now and do you think that's because you've been in that kind of life where you feel like you can see that enough to want to help yeah, totally. It's like, like you, you understand it more because it's yeah. easy to go, oh, you know, the poor kids, but you know, you're thankful for what we've got. When actually, there's there's so many problems out there that, you yeah. know, and it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to give to food banks when you can't get food yourself, and mm. you know, all the things like that. Do you know? Do you know what I, I would say about like, and and that to I totally get it. Like, I totally understand that swaths of the, the the population are being furloughed. There's a lot of uncertainty about jobs when, when this gets lifted with, with, with people working in certain industries. But I would honestly turn around and say, like, since I've been in the situation since we've been locked down, like, the service to others, that doesn't mean you have to be a multi-millionaire football player to, to help people. Like, that could be you helping your next-door neighbour. That could be if you've got the resources, you go and you go and volunteer at the food bank. Um, there's there's so many different things you can do, like, tangible things. And even, even if it's, like... The other day, like the the, the the waste disposal men come down my road, and and I and I saw them, and I was watching these guys and had all the masks and stuff on, and 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 do you know what, Helen? I went to the cash machine and I drew out forty pound, and I went up to them and the guy was like standing away from me, and I said, no mate, look, just buy yourself some beers or whatever, or some coffee, and I put it in the windscreen wiper. And honestly, you should have seen the look on his face. Aww. Now I know, not, I understand people listening to this, people might not be able to do that, but just showing appreciation to these people yeah, because yeah, yeah. they are doing so much for us. And, and I really think, and it made me feel amazing to know that I made that man in that moment feel great. And yeah. I'm, in the situation we're currently in together now, we're all in this together. Like, yeah. all of us, we're all one, we're just human beings. And I think if you can help someone now, this is the moment to do it and, and reach out and show people that we're in this sort of situation together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are the common challenges right now that people are asking you about? Like, have you got people reaching out to you and saying, how do I deal with, you know, what are the kind of things that people are... That's so, so like, I'm, I'm getting more sort of contact from people that want to help. Like, they want to create content to give to children that are being homeschooled. Um, a lot of people that work in the youth sector are very mindful and very concerned um, because their their day to day activity with these children, they now know that they know the situations to what the home life a lot of these kids are going back to. But now there's no escape from that, and they're yeah. really concerned about these kids now being in that situation for 24 hours a day. So, like, I'm getting asked more to create content um, to try to give kids sort of some element of hope um, that, you, again, you, you can use this situation to, to, to sort of better yourself and try to get some self-growth out of it. Um, but, yeah, it, it's mostly towards young people um, and, and sort of people within the prison system, within young people. Because right now, like, there's, there's, there's nearly 3,000 young men and girls completely, literally locked up now for 23 and a half, 24 hours a day. Yeah, and, and, yeah, they're, yeah. and they're so vulnerable, like with mental health issues. Um, and hopefully some of these kids end up getting released. If the Secretary of State starts releasing people from the prison service, like young kids. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very concerning. It's just trying to give that little bit of hope that you can build yourself in this situation. Yeah. And of course, with part one also being um, with, with a pause button firmly pressed, it, that make, it impacts even more in the prison system, doesn't it? Which makes that even harder because there's no, you know, there isn't no, there's no just escape into a part run kind of environment. There, there's nothing, yeah, there's, there's nothing at the moment. And it, and it really does concern me, like, um, that you've got so many children and men and women um, currently just locked up for 23 and a half, 24 hours a day, like, and a lot of them have developed or have mental health issues anyway. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you always get, you always get instinctively drawn to children. 
Um, and yeah, yeah that, that's that's my biggest concern, and that's why like I've been trying to think outside the box. And um, and, there, and there's been like I, I put a post up the other day, and I said, look, if there's any authors or there's anyone with resources that, have, and even now, anyone that feels like they can donate stuff to prisons, if that's puzzles, books, whatever it is, just DM me, and I'll put you in contact with the appropriate people at the Ministry of Justice, and we make yeah. sure that these kids have got activities to do in themselves instead of just basically sitting on a bed all day looking at four walls yeah. um, with no real mental stimuli. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, John, let's go to some questions. Um, Rachel Bentley has asked, what keeps you motivated? Um, what keeps me motivated? Uh, to constantly just keep getting growth um, in the regards of, like, developing as a person, trying to have a greater impact in the world. Um, like I, 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 I don't know. Sometimes some people say I'm, I'm never, I never really appreciate how far I've come and what I do, um, because when I when I do something and I, I'm successful and I achieve it, I'm always literally wake up next day and I, I, I want to do something. I want to help more people, um, and it's very addictive. Like helping people is quite addictive because <laughs> it makes you feel great. And when yeah, you it great does. People, yeah, it does. It, it, it really makes you does. Feel amazing. Yeah, and when, yeah. when, you, when you're reaching out and and you're doing things for people that can't do anything in return for you, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. Because I always say this, if you ever do anything for anyone and you're expecting something back, you're not helping them, you're doing business. There's, yes. a, there's, a, very, there's a difference. Yes. Okay, uh, Tom Williams, we know him. He says, your ability seems to have played a large part in your positive journey. How do you advise people who may want to turn their lives around but aren't natural athletes? Um, I would say, I, I'm an avid believer of this, I, I think every person is good at something. Um, I was very, very, very lucky I stumbled into sport. I didn't intentionally mean to do it. It was someone outside of my control, a prison officer, seeing how good I was. Um, and he, he planted that seed in my head, and then that allowed that seed to grow. And I would say to anyone, I believe everyone's good at everything. But some think, I think you have to just open yourselves up to try different things. And once you find that passion, I think it becomes very easy to become good at it or better at it and just be the best that you can be you don't need to be the world's best runner to love running and, and want to keep growing and want to yeah. keep being the best that you can be it's not about what other people can do it's about what you can personally do yourself yeah because i think it, that's hard as well isn't it at a time when we really need social media sometimes you can look into it and feel worse because you're not running as much as the person next to you or walking as for as long as the next person you can see and it can be that terrible comparison all the time and which can make you feel worse especially if you're struggling to get out in the first place i think that's the hardest thing do you have you got any um tips for people who really struggle to motivate themselves what the best thing you can do to get out of that mindset just to, to move again it's, it's taking small steps like you're not just going to, like, people don't just wake up one morning, like, like I didn't just get on a ram machine one day, and then within a day, I, I, I got as good as I did on that ram machine. Like, it took literally months and months and years of consistent chipping away at a mountain. Like, when I first got on it, so, like, now, I, I was awful. Um, but it's just, it, it, you have to set realistic goals at the beginning. Like I said, if I woke up one morning and said, oh, tomorrow I'm going to row for 45 hours and I'm stuck, it was not, it wouldn't have been possible. I wouldn't have been able yeah. to do it. But it's about those small incremental little steps. It's always about just trying to be a little bit better tomorrow than you was today. And I think that's what's important. It's just a constantly like, and even if that means someone listening to this now, it's never run a step in their life. And that means you going out tomorrow and you doing a, a 10 or 15 or five minute power walk. That's all that matters. And it's just, and building up to that run. It's just those small little steps. You haven't got to go and run 5K straight off the bat. It's just building it up nice and slowly. And eventually setting that goal and then achieving it. I think that's a great thing to remember, isn't it? That, you know, even reading your amazing book, Redemption, you know, what you don't get, what you'd never get, would be the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and weeks and months and months of time that you put into something. Uh, and somebody's just, just commented in the post just that that's the beauty of part one. You can just go back every week, and if you want to get better, you can get better, but you've got forever when the pause button is not paused anymore. You it, just it, go back every week. It's got that every time, hasn't it? And, and, that's, the, and that's the thing. Like someone, someone actually said this to me recently, and I never thought it through this dimension before, but they said it isn't about the power of sport. It's about the power of people. And, and it's so true because sport, is the is is the is the opening of the door, but it's the people that you meet along that journey that make your life and fulfil it. 
So, like, for instance, with me, everything I've ever done as an athlete is irrelevant, really. Like, numbers on machines and how fast I can run, it doesn't mean much. But yeah. actually, the people that I've managed to meet throughout my life by doing those things, they're the people that have actually changed my life. Prison yes. officer Darren Davis, Terry Williamson, the guy that helps me today with everything, like, they're the ones that have added the colour into my life and changed my life to what it is today. And that's like the part when it's a community. It's about when you go to those environments, it's the people you meet, the friendships you develop. They'll be the things that will literally last with you to the day that you die. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so let's have some more questions before we um, sign off. So Michelle Glassup says, when will there be a feature film and who will you, who will play you? Um, yeah, just, Great. do you know what? Like, yeah, I, they're, 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 we, we are in some talks and stuff. Like, there's, there's a few people who have approached me to do it. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not that egotistical. Like, I don't know who. Like, whoever, whoever, do you know what? If it, if it, if it does end up happening... It would be made for the right reasons, and and the film would purely be a vehicle for me to use that film to do something bigger with it. Um, yeah. And it would have to be the right people involved in it for that to ever sort of end up happening. That's great. Lo love to hear that. Um, as Amy says, any tips for a faster five k? Um, five. Yeah, it's not really my distance. I would <laughs> I would say obviously consistency is the biggest thing, and not getting injured. I've noticed that personally in my own running. Um, it's about like not doing those, those massive sort of hero sessions where you go and mash yourself up you do it day after day after day and you overtrain and end up getting injured i would say with running in my own personal experience is about the consistency of day in day out just being able to run and not get injured and have that consistency and then i found ironically i'm probably in the best run shape i've ever been in now and i was meant to do the london marathon in a couple of weeks and now that's obviously not happening but um but i've been very consistent this year and, and my running's improved so much because of the consistency of not being injured Okay. Uh, Caroline and Lenny say, what do you think is stronger? This is a good question. The mind or the body? Mind. That's shadow of doubt. I think what, what the mind, I know it's quite cheesy, but what the mind believes, the body will achieve. And, and, I, and I, obviously I've experienced the physicality of that. Um, like where I've, when I've done stuff, like I sat on a round machine for two days solid and rode. Um, and my, I remember my body was screaming for me to stop and I was so tired, but my, it was like, and I get more satisfaction out of that because then it's my yeah. mind controlling my body and making me not stop. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. Katriona says, if you could go back in time and do anything differently, would you? <sighs> do you know what? I, like, I regret everything I'd done um, in my past um, that led me to go to prison. And I'm deeply regretful of everything I've done. But I would not... If, if you said to me now I wouldn't have had to spend 10 years in prison, I would have wanted to spend... And I know it sounds bizarre, yeah. but, but being in that situation is where it, it's, it's made me the person I am today. And that was my life journey. And I needed to be in that place. And I actually think going in that place saved my life. Okay. Um, I, I think I would have died up otherwise. So, yes. You wouldn't be the person you are now because you've no. had to go through that. Yes, I had to go through that journey and experience that and come out the other side of it. And that's made me the man that I am today. And I suppose if we were going to compare that to where we are now, the resilience that you learn inside with being stronger in mind and body, but mostly in your mind, is the resilience that we're all going to hopefully learn and come out when, when, when the pause button is not paused anymore and we can all go outside. It would be great to think that we all had a bit more resilience at the end of it, wouldn't it? Like, that's going to be a bonus, I think. I keep thinking that the kids are going to, they're going to be learning so much, even though it doesn't feel great to not be seeing their friends. But it, sometimes we need hardship to understand, like you were saying, you know, all the things that we took for granted before we won't anymore, which is... And, and, and do, do, you know, do you know what, Helen, like... Like, I'll, I'll just leave you on this last note because I know I know everything at the moment. Is, there's, there's a lot of misery going on in the world. But I would say to everyone listening to this now, I genuinely believe in the long term for humanity, for, for, for the country, for all these countries around the world, this is going to be, and I know the people that have lost their lives, it's very sad and sad things, but I do think for the, for the bigger picture of the earth, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a good thing. And I, I think good will end up coming out of this for the long term of humanity. I, I think scientists will be able to get data to prove the, the, what the effects that humans have on the earth now, where we've not been flying so much and driving so much and, and all those sorts of things. And, and also, it's, a, it's allowed us now to, the people that society sometimes hero worships and we place value on, when we now look, the people that collect our bins, that serve our food, that are in the shops, the NHS, doctors, police officers, army, 
these people that go and do these jobs every day that not necessarily appreciate and put on that same pedestal as someone that can kick a ball around, I really think society now, society's mind shift will see the value, the true value of these people. And actually, yeah. these people are the heroes and inspirations of our society. And I, I, I really, really believe that's going to be the case after this. Yeah, I completely agree. It's like we can see who makes the world go round. Yes. We need, we need all of these people. Yes. To be able to have our get our food from the shop and be able to have our you know patients being looked after in hospital. Okay, so let's go through. We've got three more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Jean says, do you think it's important for other prisons to sign up for Park Run? A hundred percent. And and I and I will do everything in my power and any element of influence that I've got to, to sort of make that happen. It is it genuinely is when you experience it, and, and, I, and I don't know how it runs with other prisons allowing outside visitors, but, in, but for instance, in Feltham, I would say the visitors that go into the prison is it's even more profound for them than it is the kids. Because people go in and then they realise these kids aren't so dissimilar to my kids. Yeah. They just made a bad decision at, yeah. at that crossroad, and that's what's led them to be in this space. Because they're children, and they just made bad life choices, not mistakes, life choices based on what they thought was right and wrong. Yeah. So I'm a massive advocate, and I think Park Run should be in every single one of the 138 prisons across the whole country. Brilliant. Tom Lenson, 2003, says, what's your favourite film? Um, my favourite film would probably be The Machine Gun Preacher with Gerard Butler. Oh, I haven't seen that. It's, it's amazing. True is story. It? Yes. Oh, very is good. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll I get that one story. on the list. Shakespeare Jack says, what advice have you got for the children and young people right now that are missing the safety and the structure of school? Which is a really good question because, you know, the kids kind of, I mean, we've noticed it with our five-year-old much more so than with the eight-year-old. She's missing her friends, but the five-year-old really needs that routine. We've, we've recognised that. So other than routine, what, what other advice would you give to young people? So like, if, if young people are currently watching this right now, I would say don't lose hope. This is going to come to an end sooner rather than later. Um, whilst you've got this time, don't stop learning. Don't stop growing. I know it's going to be hard now to like to maybe study your English and maths, but look at other things that you have an interest in. If you, if, if you like English, start poetry or music, whatever it is, but just keep learning and keeping that brain active. Keep absorbing information. Just keep absorbing information. Keep learning. It doesn't necessarily have to be English, maths and science. It could be all different sort of things, but... Just don't sit on computer games all day. Don't just sit around doing nothing. Be active and try to absorb as much information as you possibly can through technology. Don't just absorb garbage. Absorb something that you're going to learn and develop and grow from it. Brilliant. Right. Well, so thanks so much for your time. Thank Thanks you so me. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Where can, where can people find you online? Because you are inspirational. Um, yep. Yeah, um, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter. Okay. So you are on Instagram and Twitter. And you've just been on the Ritual podcast, haven't you? Um, no, I was on that last year. Um, but there's a podcast coming out tomorrow um, with, uh, with Dr. Rogan. So I'll post it up and then people, when they follow me, they can sort of yes. go on. Yes. So you are... Uh, on Instagram, you are Johnny Mac eighty three. So if you if you give them a, a find on there, and you've got the real McCoy, real McAvoy, real yeah, McCoy. Real <laughs> um, that's thanks so much for your time, Thank you. John. Um, so do check out the many social part run part run social media channels. I'll never say that right in the UK and across the world, as well as subscribing to the various part run podcasts out there. You'll find me, like I said earlier, on the Free Willy Time podcast. But there's also With Me Now and Park Run Adventures, to name a couple of others. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Now more than ever, it's important that we still all come together and support each other. The Park Run family is there for us all, and we will get through this together. Take care, everyone. Thanks, bye. John. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.